gosh. Did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy Professor Eager's lecture covering my theory and book on the origins of species by means of natural selection? Yes, I enjoyed his lecture very much. But I was surprised when Professor Igor said, History seems to have downplayed Charles Darwin's scientific contribution compared to other famous scientists as Einstein and Newton. They used the language of mathematics to present their ideas, while Darwin used ordinary English. His theory is thus readily understood by non-scientists young and old. Yes, I have heard this idea quite often, and I smile. Perhaps this reputation of mine actually benefits science in the long run. When people learn of my work, they say, I am certainly as mentally well equipped as Darwin was when he made his big scientific discovery. I'll give it a good shot. On the other hand, I am not entirely sure an average scientist has the unique brain, such as Einstein or Newton, to work out the complexities of mathematical physics. I should like to think that biologists, well, naturalists, are so much more down-to-earth. Thus, we are quite comfortable in not only loving Mother Nature, but also in understanding her. Professor Igor said that when you first explained your natural selection theory to your good friend Thomas Huxley, Huxley exclaimed, How stupid of me not to have thought of it myself! Doesn't this offend you? No. Many people seem to think that I should have been offended by this remark. On the contrary, it quite pleased me. Would you not prefer to create a new theory that is readily understood by everyone, rather than to create a theory only a few well-educated people can grasp? Maybe so. But Professor Igor says, Almost all important theories and discoveries, when they are ready to be discovered, are simultaneously invented by multiple scientists who come up with the same idea. My favorite story is about the scientist credited with discovering X-rays. Although other people also worked in this specific field, and some had actually constructed working X-ray machines, history gives credit to only one man, Wilhelm Röntgen. The only obvious exception to this rule is Einstein's theory of general relativity. Many physicists believe that if Einstein had not proposed this theory in 1916, it is very probable that even today, general relativity would still be undiscovered. If your theory of natural selection is really so easy to understand, why did it lie undiscovered for 19 years when Alfred Russell Wallace proposed the same theory? Even if the theory you proposed were not controversial, even if Mr. Wallace had not proposed a nearly identical theory, is it possible that even today, in the 21st century, the mechanisms by which various species originated would still be a mystery? Now well, that is an interesting question. The answer, of course, is that one can never know for certain. I will say, though, that when a scientist proposes a theory, one which contradicts some contemporary wisdom, they usually are some fireworks, particularly when a scientific theory is at odds with religious belief. When Galileo proposed that the sun was the center of our celestial system, not Earth, he and his family suffered public humiliation and great pain. Are you saying that if Wallace had not come up with what was basically your theory, or even if he had but didn't want to publish it, that you might never have published On the Origin of Species because you were scared? Sadly, this may be the case. I might have kept my theory a secret, except from close friends. I was afraid to become the black sheep of the family, which is exactly what happened. Professor Igor says that the percentage of people who rejected your theory in 1859 is approximately the same as those who do today in 2011. 
Oh, that is a really confusing statistic and should not be taken at face value. While the percentage of people who rejected my theory in 1859 has not changed very much in 150 years, what has changed dramatically is that today 99% of scientists believe my theory. In 1859, a vast majority of scientists, along with the general public, had numerous unresolved problems accepting it. What kind of problems? Well, you must remember, Mr. Tompkins, that today every schoolchild knows about genes, chromosomes, and the existence of DNA, and that changes in DNA cause mutations. In 1859, all this had yet to be discovered. However, it has been known since ancient times that offspring resemble its parents. Farmers and ranchers have practiced artificial selection since the agricultural revolution began 12,000 years ago, though they had no idea then of the mechanism for what we today call inheritance. Common folklore held that physical biological characteristics from parents to child were, so to speak, blended. But if this were true, then neither artificial nor natural selection would work, and my theory would have been proven wrong. Blending theory was finally refuted by the work of an Austrian monk, Gregor Mendel. From 1856 to 1863, he conducted experiments with 29,000 pea plants in a quest to uncover the mechanisms of trait inheritance. Mendel, in one experiment, cross-pollinated purebred plants with certain traits, such as a plant with white flowers mated with a plant with purple flowers. Offspring had either white flowers or purple flowers, not pink or lavender. Mendel hypothesized that some biological factor distributed the traits in small units, units later to be called genes. I had long searched for such an explanation for trait inheritance, but to no avail. Mendel's findings were that explanation. Though Mendel and I were historical contemporaries, we unfortunately never met. However, he did read On the Origin of Species in 1862 and knew his studies supported my theory of natural selection. Regrettably, his breakthrough helped neither me nor him during our lifetimes. I died in 1882 and he in 1884, so we could have communicated but we did not. His research, rather than becoming elevated to the heights it deserved, languished in obscurity. Until 1900, that obscurity disappeared when other scientists came to the same conclusions as Mendel, only to discover that Mendel had been there first. Well, I'm glad Mendel's research eventually supported natural selection. But after all this, I'm still, I'm still a bit confused as to what natural selection actually is. Ah, my apologies, sir. I, as well as others, knew that all biological organisms produce more offspring than can possibly survive in their local environment. And we also all knew that there is no such thing as two identical organisms. Not even identical twins are identical. So, let us say that only 1% of the organisms survive until adulthood. I suggested that part of the reasons that the 1% survived is that they just might have an inheritable trait that would have helped that particular organism survive in that particular climate. If that trait is an inheritable trait, then there is some chance that the organism's offspring will also have this surviving variational gene, and so on and so forth in future generations. Thus increasing the species' chances for survival. By Jove, I think I've got it. Thanks. 
So then I suppose you came up with natural selection during your five-year mission aboard the Beagle. Actually, no. But your question reflects a common misconception that arose soon after I published on the origin of species in 1859. The theory of natural selection came to me in 1838, two years after the end of my voyage. The trek did, however, lay the groundwork for me to eventually construct my theory. Groundwork. That's an ironic term to describe a sea voyage. But how'd you decide to even take the trip? Well, in 1831, I was 22, a recent graduate of Christ's College at Cambridge. I had just escaped university with a bachelor's in theology, with the aim of becoming an Anglican parson, of all things. And prior to Cambridge, I'd even dropped out of medical school. So, like many young people, I floundered a bit. One summer day, I returned from a Welsh geology tour to find a letter from my botany professor. He suggested I take a volunteer, unpaid, self-funded position as gentleman's companion to the captain of HMS Beagle. The ship leaves on a two-year investigation of the South American coastline in four weeks. An adventure. However, my father, the bank, so to speak, was leery of the trip because I had been extravagant with money while at Cambridge. I will give my consent only if you can find any man of common sense who advises you that the Beagle is where you belong. Thankfully, my uncle Josiah Wedgwood was considered by my father to be one of the most sensible men in the world. I say the voyage is in Charles's best interest. And father, listen. Well, I should be juicy clever to spend more than my allowance while aboard the Beagle. Ah, oh, but they tell me you are very clever. Ah, oh, but all right. So on December 27th, 1831, I embarked from England on what became a five-year circumnavigation of the globe. Contrary to popular conception, I was not the Beagle's assigned naturalist, but, as I mentioned earlier, a gentleman companion to its captain, Robert Fitzroy. In general, captains of HMS ships were quite isolated and lonely. They could not mingle with the crew because of the marked gap in social status. The Beagle's previous skipper had even committed suicide due to the forced solitude. Thus Fitzroy brought me aboard as a gentleman companion with whom he could converse at mealtime. Fitzroy was a truly bold and noble gentleman of good breeding, a more vivacious master and commander or loyal friend one would be hard-pressed to find. However, he also possessed a terrible temper, worse in the early morning. It might erupt if something about the ship did not meet his approval, and since he was a staunch supporter of slavery, and I an ardent abolitionist, well, we were oil and water. I am amazed we did not explode upon contact, trapped together on this small ninety-by-twenty-four-foot boat for five long years. Gee, sounds like you really enjoyed the trip. Oh, and on top of that, I was seasick every second aboard that ruddy ship. Dreadful, just dreadful. The trip also gave me years of quiet study, and the library here in my very cramped cabin was a boon. Watch your head, Tonkins. The works of my day's greatest thinkers, such as Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, were my true companions. Lyell was a major influence, 
Via Fitzroy, he gave me the first volume of Principles of Geology, so I could look for the glacial erratics, rocks carried by glaciers from one location to another. In volume two, Lyle wrote, An intimate connection exists between geology and the study of the present condition of the animal and vegetable kingdoms. He basically goes on to say that Earth and all its plants and animals do not exist in a static state, but are always in constant flux. Oceans become deserts. Mountains become seas. Lyle's ideas contradicted my Anglican Christian upbringing. For example, I was taught to believe the writings of James Usher, Anglican Archbishop of Armagh, Ireland. In 1654, he calculated that creation began on that nightfall before October 23, 4004 BC. Such teachings as this argue that Earth was completely static after the Great Flood, when it was repopulated by the animals aboard Noah's Ark. Modern studies from your time, Tompkins, concluded that life actually first appeared on Earth some four billion years ago. The first organisms were somewhat more similar to the bacteria of today. The total number of species that ever lived on this planet were perhaps as many as two billion, with 99% of them going extinct. As you can see, this information is certainly at odds with the static model of creation that I originally taught. Fitzroy and I took meals together here in his cabin, and whilst we ate, I related what I had found upon my explorations. The more convinced I became of a dynamic Earth with a fluctuating biology, the more agitated became Fitzroy. Maybe these animated discussions enhanced your then heretical views. Ha! Huh. That's what Stephen J. Gould said. That man studied my writings more than almost any other person. Perhaps in a later dream you shall learn of his own evolutionary theory, a punctuated equilibrium. You know, your solitude aboard the Beagle is... well... Well, it's really quite similar to that of Einstein while he worked as a patent clerk, dreaming up his own revolutionary physical theories. You are right. Though far from ideal, the Beagle voyage was the most important event in my life. It determined my whole career. Professor Igor says that you're probably the most misunderstood scientist who ever lived. So tell me, did you actually ever say, as your critics have chided, that humans are descendants of monkeys or apes? Or is that just the sort of misinformation that surrounds your name? On the origin of species, never claimed that human beings were directly descended from apes. Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, a popular book explaining natural history, was published in 1844. It proposed that the immediate progenitors of the human species were monkeys, vestiges. Together with my vociferous supporter, Thomas Huxley's mission to convince the world that man is indeed a primate, inextricably linked me with this notion. I merely implied that light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. What about social Darwinism? I've heard the term but don't know exactly what it means. Does it have something to do with the idea that poor people and poor nations are inferior to rich people and rich nations? Generally, the term is used derogatorily. It describes ideologies which appropriate natural selection to justify greedy, selfish, racist, or nationalistic causes. Such ideologies should more correctly be considered examples of misguided biological determinism. Staunch adherents to biological determinism many times are racial supremacists. Hitler comes to mind as the most monstrous racial supremacist. I am saddened if people think, yuck, if they think that I belong to such an unsavory lot. 
How about survival of the fittest? Didn't you coin this term? No, but I must admit that I appropriated it for the subtitle to the fifth edition of Origin, though certainly not in order to further any biologically determined world view. It was just a phrase I got from the philosopher-anthropologist Herbert Spencer, who coined it after reading my book. I simply like the sound of it. it. has a certain ring, don't you agree? Well, hello, Annie. Oh, I am in trouble now, Tompkins. I have teed with you when I should be home, having tea with my wife and ten children. This here is my daughter Annie. Annie, this is my new friend, Mr. Tompkins. Hello there. Well, come along, Annie. We do not wish to be late for tea. Farewell, Tompkins. <gasps> I guess I shouldn't have eaten those atomic fireball jawbreakers right before bed.